Welcome to Style Masterclass, the podcast that teaches women to look stylish and feel confident so that they can show up ready to conquer and slay no matter what size they are. I'm your host, Miss J. You ready? Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Style Masterclass podcast. I'm your host, Judith Catan, aka Miss J. This is another one of our bonus episodes in our amazing series, Shit My Mama Said. Although we're going to have a variation sort of on a theme today, which is really fun. Today's guest is my friend Kelly. And I want you to introduce yourself to the folks. Kelly, take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Forsberg. I am an Army veteran. And I really first connected with Judith on a style level one evening, super late, just kind of impromptu uh, coaching. And we had got on that call to help her. And then she's like, oh yeah, you got like a whole bunch of issues in your closet, girl, that are. (laughs) So it kind of just evolved from there, but I am a life coach now and I'm still entangling my own wardrobe, both my thought wardrobe and my actual clothes in my closet and figuring out what life looks like after the military. So I'm so glad we get to chat today because I think the conversation we're going to have is going to be so fun and so relatable. So even if you have not served in the military, folks, there's going to be some takeaways here because there's certain mindsets that we get and then we sort of carry them with us even when our roles change. So Kelly and I are going to dive into that a little bit today. So, and also let me pause. Thank you for your service. (laughs) Thank you for your support. I love my time in service. Which I love that you loved it, right? Because I think sometimes we change roles and we have this like story that we tell ourselves about how terrible it was so that we can feel better about having changed a role as opposed to like, no, I just loved it. It was amazing. And that that was done. That chapter closed. Oh, yeah. And I'm like anyone who has been in the military is they might have their own story or they might be rolling their eyes at me saying there's no way she loved it. But I really did. And, you know, there were some rainy days and we were still putting the tent up and taking it down on those rainy days. But overall, it was a big chunk of growth in my life and on to the next phase. But I prefer to think of it fondly. Yeah, I love that. So tell me about the transition from service to, I guess, regular civilian life. What was that like for you? Oh my goodness. I was a mess. So my very last day on active duty, I was stationed in Hawaii and I was sitting on our air mattress because we had packed everything else up and we just kept the air mattress out and I was holding my PT shirt. So it's like just black, yellow letters that say army. And I was holding it in my hands and I was just crying and I didn't want to go. And I had to get on a plane that day. and I just didn't want to. So I thought that it would be best if I got home to a civilian life that I should change absolutely everything and that would help me feel better. So I cut all my hair off and I got highlights and I started wearing a bunch of jewelry and I made everything really complicated and kind of just tried to keep the army version of myself in a duffel bag with my uniforms. and surprise, I was so unhappy. And I didn't realize that who I was could exist out of the uniform, but in real life, that wasn't military life. And it was a bumpy road. And I thought I had everything figured out. I'm like a natural planner. And when you leave the military, you go through, I'm not sure what it's called in all the branches, but in the army, it's SFL TAP, Soldier for Life Transition Assistance Program. And I had answered everything. And by this time I had, I was going through life coach certification. So I had, I had some tools in my belt and I was like, I got this. I'm going to move here. We're going to buy a house. I'm going to get this job. I'm going to do these things. It was not such a straight line like the military was. Well, okay. And I, I, there's, oh, there's so much like, I'm like, oh, juiciness. But f- for anyone who's listening, fill in the blank, right? After you got out of law school, after you got out of medical school, after you got out of undergrad, you know, 
finishing your first job, quitting your first job, like becoming an entrepreneur, like whatever role change you've had, oftentimes my clients have the same thought process you did. I'm going to change everything, right? So chopping the hair, the highlights, like really thinking that somehow if they change how they look externally, it will help them like to better identify with this new identity or new role they're taking on. But they're like actioning their way through as opposed to, (laughs) I just see you like smiling, right? They're like, I'm a man handle this, right? Like super masculine energy. Like I'm going to solve the shit out of this and not really think about how I'm feeling or thinking. And then even using thought work, right? Like self-help work as part of their like muscling their way through thing that they do. Like it just didn't work, right? So tell me when you realize it wasn't working. Okay. I have to have gratitude for not the pandemic, but for the situation the pandemic put me in because I applied to literally everything. I had started in intelligence and then I moved to logistics. So I'm like, I have skills. I am very hireable. And I applied to so many jobs from UPS to FedEx to Walmart. Like it didn't matter. I was like, let me help you with your warehouses it wasn't happening. I don't, I don't know if it was like a COVID function or just the greater universe forces that be, but it just kind of wasn't happening. I looked in the mirror figuratively and just realized that I was just really unhappy. And I asked myself the big old question, what do you want? What do you actually want? And I realized that what I missed more than anything was being around other veterans. And that was a huge turning point for me where I was like, wow, I don't have to give up on my entire military self to to fit in. I also don't have to give up on myself to become something new. I can take whatever pieces of that army version of me with me that I want and create something new. So the answer to what do I want was to find a way to help veterans and to be more in that community. And it turns out that there's like a local veteran center, 10, 15 minutes away from my house. So I started teaching yoga there and getting more involved. And I'm a mentor for the veterans therapeutic court and a couple other pieces like that, in addition to life coaching. And it just started to feel like a warm hug. And it wasn't super easy, but it was touching my soul. And just, it started to get me out of bed in the morning instead of trying to recreate something I had in the military where I knew that I loved that experience. So I was like, okay, if giving up everything in the military is not the option and recreating everything I had in the military, isn't the option. What is that happy medium? And that's kind of where I'm at now. Oh, I love that. And here, y'all, is how you can apply this to yourself, right? So Kelly realized like both extremes don't work. So sometimes you're like, okay, you know, when I lost all the weight, and this is a common one I hear, right? When I lost all the weight and I was basically half starved and a cookie would have broken me, like, I want to go back to there because everything fit. And it's like, okay, hold up. (laughs) Like, let's remember this with reality, right? There were rainy days. There, it wasn't always perfect. And this perfectionist fantasy version that you've developed in your mind sometimes of like, if I could only just take these things and apply them like, like fell swoop over here, everything would be wonderful. But that's, that's not reality. Like you will have evolved and changed. So the things you did then, the thoughts you had then, the feelings you had then, they're not a one for one trade off. Now there's lessons we can learn. There's things we can take. Like, I love that you took, and I, here's the beautiful thing. I just love this takeaway is, is not necessarily that you like took the same skills, right? Because you were applying for logistics jobs and that's not the skill set you took. You just went to being around your people. The familiarity, the feeling part of it is what you brought with you. Like oftentimes I'll talk to my clients about the big suitcase and then as they evolve, their suitcase just gets more like fabulous and smaller. So we get to be more thoughtful about what we take forward with us. We can do those same things. Sometimes it'll be our skill set, y'all, but sometimes it's also like, what feeling did you have then? How can we create that for you now? What thoughts were you thinking and feelings did you create then? 
we can bring that forward without it being a one for one trade. Like she didn't go back to her army t-shirt necessarily, but (laughs) she wasn't completely rejecting that part of herself either. I just, I love, love, love that so much. So you said you're in the happy medium. What's the happy medium like for you? Yeah. So still in progress, but I'm a big believer of always being in progress. So I probably won't ever say I'm all the way there, but on the physical aspect, it looks like wearing my hair in a French braid again, because that was my favorite way to have my hair when I was in the military. And I had this like total nonsense that I could only be a successful civilian if I wore my hair down and styled every day. (laughs) The rules we create, right? (laughs) And that was like a lot of work. So I was I just told myself I couldn't leave the house if I was not going to do my hair. So got rid of that and having more fun. I, so fun. Uh, there's this thing in the military, we call it fundatory, meaning like fun and mandatory, mandatory fun, all that. And fun just happens when you are with your community of people, that camaraderie it's like, it doesn't matter how terrible the job is. It can be enjoyable when you're with each other. And if it's not, you just find a way to make it enjoyable so that you survive and everything. Um, (laughs) You find a way to make it fun so you can survive and everything. I love that definition (laughs) of fundatory. That's amazing. (laughs) So more fun, just, yeah, doing more of what, what we want to be doing as a family and as me, I guess, alone sometimes. And also not caring so much. That was a big thing is I kept waiting for someone to give me permission to be the person in the civilian world that I wanted to be. So like, Hey, Kelly, you've done great things in the military, go forth and do your life coach thing. Great job. And Like there are no voices outside that say that because you don't have the chain of command. You don't have this government entity that requires things of you. It just is you and what your family needs and what your friends need. And sure, there are outside influences, but it's a whole lot more of what do you need? And what I needed was to serve people. And so when I was sitting in my house with my hair up, (laughs) and waiting for someone to tell me what to do and it wasn't happening, I was miserable. So put that French braid in my hair, went outside and helped people and it feels a whole heck of a lot better. Well, (laughs) I love that the French braid worked in, right? Because like that's a little style thing that you brought with you that maybe that's probably not the style thing you thought you were going to bring forward, right? Like I'd imagine there were other things you (laughs) thought you might carry on with you and the French braid made it. So I... (laughs) I freaking love that. But I also think you asked yourself two really important questions. What do I want and what do I need? And I think anytime we have a life transition, somehow we don't ask ourselves those questions and then we're waiting for the permission slip that never comes. Mm -hmm. So to anyone who's listening, what would you say? Let's say they're waiting for the permission slip to build a business or to wear more civilian clothes, or even to take, you know, the French braid out into the world. Like if they're waiting for permission in some way, what would you say to them? Well, first I would question, where is it coming from? Like who needs to tell you this and what would they say? Like for me, there, there were a couple of leaders that I really looked up to and with leaders, sometimes we look up to them and they don't necessarily know. So yes, Yes. (laughs) Even more waiting for that permission that's not coming. But I would write it out yourself. Write yourself the permission from that person or that thing that you think you need it from. And then sign it yourself and see how good that feels. And if it feels terrible, that's just where you're at. And it's okay. But also realize that we are so dang powerful on our own that we can sign our own permission slips. Yes. So good. And I love that you paused, like, let's evaluate who we think we need it from. Because I know for myself, like even I agonize over the title of my book, y'all, because it has a curse word in it. 
as if I don't already curse. And I remember agonizing over it, agonizing over it. And I, w- I actually was praying about it because I was like, God, are you okay with this? What are your thing? And it's like out of nowhere, that little voice was like, do you think it's a surprise to anyone that you curse? Like, let's assume we took the title off. Like, would you still be a surprise to anyone? And it was just such a funny thought that came through. And I was like, oh, wait, I'm not a shock to God. He already knows. And this permission slip that I've been waiting for, this like asking him, begging him to approve something like (laughs) kind of not required because the thing that I'm so afraid of doing, even if I did, it wouldn't be a surprise or a shock to anybody. Right. Opposite side of that. If you wrote out a denial slip (laughs) from this person, not God, but from a person that you look up to and they said, hey, whatever you do, do not go out in public with a French braid in your hair. Like that is just not happening. Then see how you feel about that. If you're like, what are you saying? Of course, a French braid doesn't determine my success. Then you're going to know that you're a little bit too in your head to move yourself forward. And you can see that it's a little bit silly because surely Lieutenant Colonel so-and-so is not going to say, French braids are not allowed in the real world. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I like telling like the inverse. And then also kind of checks on like, how passionate are you about this thing that if you write this like fake notarized denial letter from Lieutenant Corporal so-and-so or fill in the blank authority figure that you've created, if they tell you no, how passionately are you going to fight for it? Right. And how much do you acquiesce? And that tells us a little bit about where you are. I love that idea. (laughs) I just love the idea of like, like a major army general writing you a letter and like French braids are passe. We don't do that anymore. (laughs) But we create all these rules, right? Like I'm not allowed to wear X color lipstick. I'm not allowed to wear, you know, hem length this past my knee. And if I shave my thighs, I'm a hoe or like whatever stuff we've created. Like imagine this person that you think is so important that would care, which secretly y'all, nobody really cares. But if they cared so passionately about this and wrote you a letter saying you're not allowed to shave past your knee, like how weird would that be? So yes. funny. Yes. And one of the things that I remember talking to you a little bit about is having your uniform be your resume, essentially, because it's got everything. It's got your name, it's got your branch, your unit, and these, you know, these patches. And then you can earn like more badges, like expert infantry badge, whatever. And they go up top. And the name on the street for that is Chest Candy, which I love. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> And it has your rank. So if I were to walk by, you know who I am, you know, where I live at work, essentially what my rank is. And you can make these judgments based on the information and you take that uniform off. And I love to play the game, like guess their rank (laughs) at these fundatory events when we're in, in civilian clothes, because like the haircut, the facial expression, the khaki shorts, like you just know. And (laughs) then you leave the military completely and like your wardrobe doesn't have to be your resume. Yeah. And I didn't know that. That That's so powerful because I think we're still taught in some form or fashion that it is, right? You dress for the role you want. You dress for the part you want. And I don't know how helpful that is to people in the long term because it gets you through certain roles, right? Like people know your rank, how to interact with you, you know, how to show you proper respect or you had to show them proper respect or all those things. Like now we need more like emotional intelligence to come into the picture to make those same determinations. And if we don't hone those skills first with ourselves, then with the other humans, it makes it really hard. And what if clothing had nothing to do with socioeconomic status, rank, value, worth? Like we disengage those things from each other. Whatever roles you're happening to play in life, like things get a lot juicier, maybe a little more confounding. Maybe we have to actually get to know each other a little better, <laughs> right? So we're not just guessing khaki shorts. But, you know, one thing just comes to mind when I worked at Disneyland And one of the things in the employee handbook, one of the things they stressed was like, you never know 
who you're interacting with. You can't ever judge based on dress because people here are here for recreation and leisure. They're here with their families. So you could have someone who's head of state somewhere in some place. You could have famous celebrity and you won't know because celebrity is relative, rank is relative, right? Based on how they're dressed because they're here with their families, leisurely, sweaty, gross, just like the rest of the humans queuing in lines to do things. So never assume. You never know who you're talking to. And it turns out, right, because we'd have people come through all the time that are supposed to be like A-list or, you know, get sent through the back and all things. And I'm like, he looks like that dude looks totally gross. Like he's soaked in sweat. His kid is thrown up on him. Like he's dragging his kid through the park. His kid's crying. Like normal human stuff still taking place. And I couldn't read any of that on his clothing that he's, you know, famous baseball player for a team that was in the whatever, yay sports. You know how much I know about sports based on this conversation, right? So it's just so funny. Like we have to keep that in mind as we interact with other humans. But really it starts at home. Like you're allowed to wear the French braid and doesn't mean anything, right? You can have the high and tight haircut, right? And doesn't mean anything in particular. If we shed all of those, And we just allow ourselves to be ourselves and sort of what's left. And I think that's where things get fun and a little scary for the first time for a lot of us. Yeah, because I didn't know what was left. Like I thought I was my uniform. You take the uniform off. I was just the person that was about to go to sleep before I put that uniform back on. It wasn't, there wasn't anything like hiding under there waiting to go out into the world. It really had to be created and I had to choose but I got to choose. And, oh, that was just such an important concept for me to wrap my head around that I get to choose. And it can be as big or as comfortable as I wanted it to be. So in your work with veterans, like, do you chat about this stuff? Like, cause now like, I didn't know there was a whole support system for when y'all like transition out of the military, which I think is beautiful. So how does this work sort of lend itself to the work you do with veterans. Yeah. So the transition piece, as you work your way out, it's not as much mental health support. So I think the military also helps you kind of action your way out, which is important, you know, I, to know the cost of living of the area I'm moving to, to help look for jobs, that kind of stuff, all very important. I'm not downplaying that, but the mental and emotional support of being confused about who you are And that whole identity crisis is very important. And we do talk about that a lot. And not just that, but realizing that you're not alone. And this whole military programming, aka brainwashing. I'm very fond of my military training. I say that lightly. But we don't know how to get along with people in that don't have military training right away. And some do, I'm generalizing, but I had to learn all that stuff. So that's a lot to learn all at once. You're starting a whole new life in a whole new world and discovering who you want to be and how to make it happen is a really big deal. So I do talk about that with my clients quite a bit and just reminding them that they're in charge of their destiny a little bit more than they originally thought or even imagined is a big part of it. And I mean, for all of you, I mean, here's some big takeaways that I'm getting from Kelly. Like first, what do you want? What do you need as you start to create your own identity outside of a uniform or outside of a role that you've played for a really long time? I mean, I went through this when I decided I was going to retire from full-time practice. If I'm no longer calling myself lawyer, well, then how do I introduce myself to people? Like I was stuck there for a little while. So, you know, what do I want? What do I need? And really you have more control over this than you think as you transition out of roles and your roles will change over time just because you're a human having a human experience, y'all. So I just, I really love this conversation. How can people work with you, find out more about what you do and how you help people? Yes, so I am super excited to launch my own podcast here in the next, Um, probably a couple of days. It is called A Better Civilian Life. And that is also my website. They can find more about me and the work I do and go grab some free resources on just how to get started. I have noticed with my veteran clients that 
We like warm fuzzies. We like to know that it's for us and it can help us and whatever. And my website has free resources to kind of introduce you to this work if you're new to it or unsure, but a better civilian life.com and everything is there. Yeah. And we'll include everything in the show notes. And here's the thing, even if you're not a vet, chances are, you know, a vet, <laughs> like, or, you know, several, I come from a long line of Marines. So while I'm not a vet, got tons in my life, including my dad. So even if this isn't for you necessarily, there are humans in your life who could definitely benefit from this work, share the resources with them. So thank you so much, Kelly, for being on the podcast today. And for now, everyone, we are out. Thank you for listening to today's episode. To learn more about how to work with me, go to judithgatan.com. Click on the Start Here button to get access to my free personal style class. I give you a quick style win, a confidence boost, and you walk away with the tools to start getting stylish. Who doesn't love that? See you there. Miss J out.